picks and bans. I do think that I'm just the the tier pick for Kana really did make me shake my head a little bit just because you you played so well in the Osiris right before this. Why not go back to it? I think that that might be the direction he's going. Not only that, it was also them being second pick. So you could sure. leave your solo lane to the last pick, or at least pick something that can flex between the jungle and the solo, so you're still kind of raising some question marks at your opposition for them to answer. Mm, it is going to be the Hell Band up against Ollie here. That's the same sort of band that VGS Gods went with in the last game. No no Merlin ban. The first pick team has banned in both games up until now. Now it's going to be the Jormungandr. So now VGS Gods have to leave open King Arthur, Merlin, or Gibalanke. And it's going to be Merlin and Gibalanke left open. So Merlin on the table. VGS could end up getting Gibalanke on the back half. In fact, I wouldn't be that surprised just based on the way the bans have gone. 12, this is Gibalanke first 12. pick, and it is for <laughs> bedtimes calling. The question now becomes... Does either team actually want to play the Merlin? I think so. I think Merlin is a great space controlling guy. When you're playing Agni the same way that uh, TPC was able to do last game, then you're probably going to be playing the Merlin. So VGS guys needs to keep that in the back of their mind, but instead opting for a very aggressive early game jungler. Uh, Susano has great early game engages, can easily pick people off. Mm, Susano over there for Drizzle, and it's going to be Agni instead of the Merlin. Look, I mean, TPC looked night and day better in game two than he did in game one. And if he's the same level of comfort on Merlin as he is on Poseidon, then give him Agni is, sure. is my thought process. If he's not at that same level, then then I think you got to give it to him. Ardeo on the other end, shutting down the Susano with a cripple field. We saw what VGS was able to do with Marky Sparky's Cupid, trying to shut down Arlongshan and the tier. Now Ardeo was banned away in game number two in the secondary phase, being picked before that second phase. There's the Osiris for Kana this time around. This makes a lot more sense to me. Now I think that you can almost force VGS Gods to ban Merlin here, or they can call your bluff. I, I think Nothing if I'm on VGS Gods, I may be trying to call the bluff here of the other end. I mean, clearly neither team is really valuing this Merlin that highly, so I don't know if they're going to waste a ban on it right here. It's just a matter of if they think that Ollie could play it, and they do end up using it. So Bedtime's Calling not valuing the Merlin as high as I thought. Definitely not, but there's still other threats besides Merlin that you have to worry about for space control. There's Apwash, there's Zeus, there's Jean Kui, with more wide variety of damage instead of the concentrated high burst. Still a lot of objective control maybe if they lock in the Isis and potentially a Fafnir if they want to run this Osiris jungle RDO solo lane. I don't expect that to be the case though, knowing how good Kana played the Osiris in game one. A couple mages banned away from Ollie now as Merlin and Hera off the table. A couple ADCs on the other end taken away. That's Jingwei and Soul taken away from Marky Sparky. So now VGS gods probably looking for their solo laner at this point. This was a Jormungandr last time. It's going to be Xing Chen this time around. Xing Chen recently re-added after a bunch of bug fixes that ended up being numerous buffs almost to this character. I think Xing Chen is, is in a really strong spot right now. Definitely is. Another one of these anti-hunters. When Shibalaka is getting first pick, people kind of forget that there are these selections, such as the Bologna, the Osiris, the Xing Chen. So big is going to be one to show his ugly face around the corner soon. Dodgy, actually, the last pick here for Bedtime's Calling. Lots of AoE now with this Zhang Kui. And then Dodgy, a little bit more single target focus, but can end up grouping up people with that Pow Lao ultimate. As VGS God's looking to round out their draft with an ADC, and it's going to be Medusa adding in even more AoE to their mix. I love VGS God's draft here. I mean, it's it's CC, it's AoE, it's it's team fight damage. But on the other side, Bedtime's Calling has a couple picks they've looked really good with so far. It's got to come to this. Game three, Bedtime's Calling up against VGS God's. The series conclusion coming up right now. This indeed will be the serious conclusion. One way or another, this will be the end. Bedtime's calling up against VGS God. Finch and Taco here on the call one more time as we move into that Desire match. Game number one was 15 minutes. Game two, about 27 minutes. So then this next game then should be, I, I imagine, 39 minutes if it goes up by, by 12, right? So that, yeah, expect it to be a 39-minute you know, game. A possibility, Finch, but <laughs> something I need to address before we before we get into this cast. Okay. So big, I want you to know you're beautiful to me. Yeah, what was that? Totally that came in personal. personal. He really did. He <laughs> put some anger. What did Sobek do to him? <laughs> you're loved. It's 2019. <laughs> it's okay, Sobek. It's all good. Uh, but very traditional, I would say, so far from what we're seeing from these two compositions from both these teams. Drizzle now on the Susano. He's played something different just about every game. Sarpei 
remains aggressive on the Daji this time. He'll be paired up with Ali on the Zhongkui, who's also done three different looks. Hell, Agni into the Zhongkui. So look for this team to once again be mid-game powerhouses around this Daji and Zhongkui. Things could be heating up for VGS gods, though. TPC had a really strong showing on this Agni in game two. And for him to be able to run it back after just warming up with it, essentially, I, I do feel like that can almost always be considered a good take for VGS gods. And Tier Toxics are, um, on this Xing Chen, who I feel like is almost criminally slept on lately. He's so good right now. I mean, he does so much damage with the Furious Roar. He has one of the best team fighting ultimates in the game, especially after some of the changes that it got. It can be impactful even if you have purification beads in terms of doing damage. He's got the Root as well, which can feel really strong in team fights. I mean, I I like this Xing Ching pick, man. I hope Tier Toxic can show us its value, even though he can't be on the Jormungandr. I also like seeing Kana back on the Osiris, though, for, for Bedtime's calling comparison to the tier. It's not that Kana wasn't doing some decent setups with the tier, but it felt like the Fearless was a lot more forced. Oh, I think Kana's incredibly dead here. Look at this. This is scary. This is like you left a movie theater with a bunch of money in your pocket and they're waiting to mug you outside. Oh no, what can he do up against three? He has the jukes, but you can only do so much. But the mirror was happening on the other side as poor, unfortunately, Hacky gets three-man ganked in duo. So one for one is just the team that got the first blood this time was VGS Gods. But it's a lot worse for Bedtime's Calling because, sure, you're able to find a response kill onto Hacky, but that's after the first blood has already taken place. And right. both of these teams invested the same amount of resources towards those ganks. It's just that VGS Gods are getting a much bigger payout because of the fact that they confirmed that first blood. Kana had to use the teleport, I think, earlier than he would have liked to, so that could throw his timing off entirely now. When he does have enough to go back and buy that Berserker, as Ali continues to prove he knows how to spam to laugh, by the way. Uh, we saw it on the Hell, and I guess we're seeing it again on the Jean Uh This is going to throw Kana's timing off. You know, he's probably going to want to come back as soon as he has that Berserker shield or Glad shield ready, whichever one he wants. But now he won't be able to get back for free with the teleport. I wonder if he'll still back and just walk into the lane this time. It's going to have to pretty much make the walk a commitment. I don't really think there's many other options for him here. And with that Paralyzing Spit being off the mark, I think Hacky also just dropped a possible pick opportunity onto Ollie. Very, very close. Surprised he didn't hear the laugh from Ollie that time. Maybe he realized just how close he was to, to going into the afterlife. So instead, he'll finish off the man cross town and rejoin his team quietly this time as a red buff goes down. Defended safely by Bedtime's call. And Raiden is going to pick up that initial respawn of the red buff for himself. And it makes sense early on. I don't really think that Ollie's going to have too many opportunities to try and find a pick of his own. Drizzle, TPC, and Hacky have been fairly aggressive so far. Well, most particularly Drizzle and TPC. And I think, if anything, I would bank on Susano Agni for finding a kill as opposed to the Daji Jean Kui. That's going to take some ramp up time for this Daji to really start being able to deal damage. And I don't even know if that's the plan. Reinforced Greaves coming out from Sarpe as his first option. It's so curious. We see a lot of the Talaria boots nowadays because of the MP5 and all that extra movement speed being so strong. But my man Sarpe is trying to live with these reinforced Greaves. <laughs> It could also be just the fact that VGS gods do have a lot of dot damage based characters. Medusa with the with the Viper shots, mm. TPC even, Path of Flames, Tear Drizzle toxic, yeah. also with Jetstream and, and Tier Toxic even. Yeah, Hacky, not so much, but hey, he does have the dot damage, or not necessarily dot damage, the but damage, the Ghastly yeah. Breath, the tick damage over time as well can be fairly annoying. But I am not super opposed to Sarpe's option for the Reinforced Greaves instead, especially considering that he might be a big part of the initiation for Bedtime's Calling here. I think so too, and it looks like they're going to be relying then a lot on, on Raiden and Ollie's damage to get it done. If this is signaling of things to come from Sarpe, that he's going to try and stay a little bit more bruisery than just straight up damage. Now he already has some pin on the way, you know, he's moved into that with the mace, so he's certainly going to be doing some damage for sure, but 
It's just a question of to what degree. And then when we see an adjustment, is Kana going to lean a little bit more into Bruiser than full-on tank as well to try and make up for maybe some physical damage lost? The one big thing that I'll note, though, is that if Kana does opt for magical de defense early as a rush to deal with Tier Toxic's poke, well, then he's going to be even more susceptible to these Susano ganks. So it's kind of forced for Kana to look for a, a Gladstone or the Berserker Shield early on, I think, to try and get some form of self-sustain going. That way, it, it can maybe serve as a deterrence to Drizzle. Hey, I'm full health. You don't want to waste your time coming over here. And he did wait until the teleport was finished, by the way, before he backed. Instead of walking, as Sarpe initiates Drizzle, has to use beads early on. Ultimate comes out for Marky Sparky to the chain land, but beads are used to give himself some CC immunity and get his way out of there as well. But Sarpe, Sarpe blinks right past, and Marky Sparky dead to rights. A nice gank done by Bedtime's Calling, and they'll follow that up with Ollie punishing TPC in the middle lane. That looked like a solo kill to me. I don't think that TPC was expecting Ollie to just drop him in the middle, but everyone was so distracted with the aggression happening in dual lane that Ollie had his window of opportunity to punish this Agni, I think, for probably using the Path of Flames aggressively. I think so, and probably the stun too, because Ollie's beads aren't on cooldown, but TPCs are. That makes it sound like maybe the stun was used errantly somewhere, and that key source of heal wasn't available for him to get away from the Zhang Kui. And that's an unfortunate drop if you're a VGS Gods fan. That TPC goes down the middle lane for free off a great play from Ollie. I thought it was also a really well played counter game from Sarpe. I, I right. feel as though Drizzle expected to just have all the time in the world to try and chip away a Raiden. And then when this Daji suddenly comes into play and, and just chooses to aggress onto Marky Sparky. Well, you have to make a decision then as a jungler. They both already had their purification beats forced out so quickly that I think it was for the best that Drizzle just looks to disengage for himself. I think so too. Maybe he also realized that Sarpe was way tankier than he normally expect from a dodgy at that point and he couldn't afford to stick around. But either way, you're right, Drizzle's initial Aggression there gets punished. That's the beads on cooldown for not just him, but TPC and Marky Sparky. Sarpe, as soon as that ult's up, might even look for a round two. He has plenty of targets to pull in, though Marky Sparky has the CC immunity available to him on the ultimate, so he can still likely get away as long as he can hold on to that cooldown. For now, though, everything's going to go back to relatively normal. I, I think that... Marky Sparky, if anything, just maybe has to expect the Daji to try and camp his lane. He's, without a doubt, probably one of the easier targets to punish currently for, for Bedtime's Calling. And so if they can continue to just harass this Medusa and prevent Marky Sparky from having any sort of influence, that seems to be the idea for TPC. Snatched up in that Paolo and pulled right back into his death. That's a huge Typhoon that might buy Hacky his way out of here. At the very least, it sets up for Drizzle to go in and try and find some turnaround, but he gets stunned and taken down. Scott Bros finds the kill three for one in favor of Bedtime's calling. And I could think of no convincing reason why Sarpe shouldn't have gone in there. He exactly did a perfect setup with the power. He's like the disguised sacrificial lamb for, for Bedtime's calling. You kind of ask yourself, what's this Daji doing? jumping into three people, and then you realize, oh, it's all for the powwow setup. But the real tragedy was TPC getting clipped by the powwow ultimate when he was trying to use the Path of Flames to escape. Unfortunate, and that means he gets pulled back in. Remember, those beads were forced in the 1v1 by Ollie earlier, who's now looking for the gank on the Marky Sparky. And it wasn't a secret. I'm pretty sure he was spamming the whole way down <laughs> into that gank attempt. So he gets the beads out for Marky Sparky for free. That's a big catch by Ollie. But man, what a great early game for Bedtime's calling so far. They're out in front. I do also wonder if maybe these Greaves are the pickup for Sarpe because since he doesn't have beads, it does give him some crowd control reduction. Maybe he can get out a little bit more often than normal. Well, he does have the powwow also. So on sure. Daji, you can kind of afford to not rush your, your beads as you're starting relics since you know that the powwow is typically going to buy you enough safety time where if your blink is up and ready to go, you can just wait out the duration of the powwow and then land and immediately blink away into safety. That's right, you'll be out of combat. Marky Sparky in trouble. Remember, no beads available. He'll use the ultimate. Thought maybe that he was in a 1v1, but there are no true 1v1s in Smite. Drizzle, though, finds Raiden elsewhere on the map. 
and now start paying some trouble. He does make it up onto the Palau, but where can he go out of this? He doesn't have the blink ready just yet, and TPC with a perfectly timed bomb punishes him. Not exactly worth for, for the soul Medusa pick that Bedtime's Calling were able to find in the process. And VGS gods almost seemed like they were ready for that counter initiation. Yeah. Everyone was just so quickly rotating over. So VGS gods, for what it's worth, I think, have done a decent job at helping to kind of neutralize whatever map pressure Bedtime's Calling started to develop. I can't take it as anything but a personal attack that TPC insists on going Divine Ruin second item in every other game. I don't know how to look at it any other way. <laughs> That's what it feels like. The one time he doesn't go Divine Ruin <laughs> immediately, like, he loses. So he's like, all right, <laughs> never again. Yeah, no sustain beats me, not today. Only me beats me. <laughs> TPC has had a nice game for himself. Ever since he switched over to the Agni, he really has looked much stronger for VGS Gods. And I think to your credit, you were saying they've looked better here responding to the pressure from Bedtime's Calling. And I think you're right, Marky Sparky heads up, at least gets his ultimate off to bring down Raiden, at least make him low so the rest of the team can find the trade for his life. So they're definitely making some heads up plays. And so far, there hasn't really any, been any true experience lead for, for either side. I mean, there's level differences in every role, but for the most part, I think that both of these teams are even enough that Bedtime's Calling and VGS Gods, you can kind of just feel the tension on the map with the way that these teams are choosing to try and group up. There haven't really been any solid attempts at looking for an outright tower push or an outright gold fury uh, kind of initiation so i think that both of these teams are really just content to try and buy their time farming until the the true ending of the laning phase where we start to see the breakout of some of these objective engagements that probably favors this team that's slowly but surely building up a scary shibalanke for these late game fights well they'll have the darkest of nights and a pretty powerful hunter in their own right to come in and start things off so Marky Sparky's no slouch on the Medusa, though she can feel a little bit at times more like a, a, a an ability hunter who has some pretty good autos. I think the the main difference that I'm noticing between these two teams' compositions is that Bedtime's Calling have a lot more upfront burst in, in my mind. Mm. So I, I think that if Bedtime's Calling execution isn't flawless, though, it's going to be tough for them to continuously reinitiate in comparison to VGS guys, where you kind of have a little bit more wiggle room to work with since you have these Agni bombs that are going to be able to set up long range stunts. I like the idea though of just starting up this gold fury, why not? And VGS gods can't make their way in. In fact, Connor's doing a little bit more than zoning. He's setting up. Marky Sparky goes down and Sarpay gets credit. Connor gets pulled back in by the ultimate coming out from the servers, but it's not enough. That's a huge two-man stun, though. And now Scott Bros and Sarpay both are a little too low. Drizzle pulls one back in. Tier Toxic gets the other, but Connor answers back to make it two for two. And Ollie gonna be able to push Hacky back with a single card toss out. Drizzle still wanted to go in for more, but no one else on his team all that confident that this is the push they want to try and risk it for. So TPC is going to stay a little bit more hidden in that back line. Ollie as well, full healing off of the minion wave in mid. It's jungle and support for Solo and Hunter. You factor in that Bedtime's Calling also got the Gold Fury and now a Tier 1 tower. And it definitely favors Bedtime's Calling. Taco, did you see anything that made them want that fight in particular? Is that just the power spikes for this team? Or was it just because they had Kana there and they knew that VGS gods couldn't make their way in? Bedtime's Calling just had Kana playing the perfect zone duty. And VGS gods, I think, also hesitated way too much. They, they needed to move in a lot sooner. You can't really chance the Gold Fury being brought down past that 30% th health threshold and expecting the enemy team to suddenly reset. I, I think right. if I'm Bedtime's Calling, I just stay on that Gold Fury until VGS Gods gives me a reason not to. And take a look, Kana has the only real significant experience lead in this game. He's about a level and a half ahead of Tier Toxic, who only just turned over to that level 14 just now. Maybe that's why they wanted to fight around that power play. As Sark, hey, catches out TPC and puts him down. Scott Bros finds a nice two-man stun of his own. These pulls could come through, but they're not enough. 
Looks like Drizzle had the beads. That lets him keep up the pressure on the bear, but it's not enough to take him down. Hacky falls as well to make it two for zero. But Marky Sparky will end up claiming the life of Scott Bros. A hunter for a support, though, I just can't really say that it's worth. But if Tier Toxic can make magic happen, and he will bring in down Sarpe. Beautiful wind siphon onto two, though. It's going to force Ollie and Raiden to back away. And Drizzle might be left with nowhere to run. Yeah, now that Kana's joined the show, I don't know where he can go. Drizzle falls as Ollie finds the kill. And it's three for two in favor of Bedtime's calling. And they'll move right on over into the jungle. I don't think they'll... Oh, they will start this Pyromancer just with the Jean Queen and the Osiris. This is risky. Tier Toxic's nearby and can certainly put a stop to this. The fact that Scott Bros lived for as long as they did, though, that, was huge. Uh, that is problematic for VGS gods and, and kind of an example of how their damage is a little bit more prioritized to take place over time. There's a lot of dot damage effects for VGS gods, but not a whole lot of burst damage up front. I, I think that if they're able to line up the Susano kit with the Agni kit immediately, then we could probably see a little bit more of that match for burst that we like we have from Bedtime's Calling, but it just seems as though Drizzle is kind of going off on his own as opposed to staying a little bit more alongside of his team. That's right, Drizzle a lot of the times is going to need to be that point man for his team. <laughs> that's pulling someone in, that's forcing beads or relics and putting his team in a position where they can find exactly this. Some nice kills as Raiden uses the dash, but he gets followed by the Typhoon. He's just gonna auto what he can. He had the Aussie, he was maybe hoping for some lifesteal, but it's not enough. Drizzle puts him down and he can't keep up. But that's more of what we need to see from Drizzle is exactly plays like that. Five, two, and four, it's hard to complain about his performance, but there have been a couple moments where it hasn't quite been there. Sarpe also getting a little bit bit back here, but Ollie trying to bring down Marky Sparky on his own. Doesn't have much mana though, and could end up and will end up losing the trade to the Medusa. I can't tell if Ollie is my favorite player or not. That was just, I just felt stubborn, didn't it? He stayed looking at the ultimate, didn't even want to look away from that. I mean, tried to, he didn't even have any mana. He was trying to out auto a Medusa at that point on the Jean Kui. He couldn't quite get it. And that's not even the first time we've seen him rotate over to duo lane this set. He's done it a bunch. Well, I don't think that one was as telegraphed for, for Ollie. We didn't hear the, the, the famous spam laughter exactly. into, <laughs> into the engagement, so I thought that was an a interesting changeup. But Scott Bros had no idea that he was about to get stingy and tormented right into the heart of three from VGS gods, and now Kana could pay just for being in the area, but four members of VGS gods still don't want to mess with this Osiris. Scott Bros did live long enough to at least force out the Whirlwind of Rage and Steel and the Stygian Torment, so both big Guardian Ultimates had to be used to secure his death, but they might not need them to grab Raiden. In comes Sarpe to try and back up his friend. Hacky is in some trouble. The autos from Raiden do it from range. Sarpe goes right up onto the pal out, can't find anything with the chains, and instead comes right back down. They make it one for one, support for support, but BTC do lose their tier one. Drizzle, I think he heard the speed bus happening, but can't get there in time. Drizzle, though, waiting to see if Sarpe is going to take the bait of trying to pick up his own speed buff immediately. And in thinking better, Dodgy's okay. just going to sit around and wait. But Ollie could be picked out right now, pushed up way too far into the mid lane without anybody from his team to help back him up right away. He won't have his beads when he comes back either as Kana gets hit by the stun for Marky Sparky. It doesn't set up any more kills, but it's to disengage BTS God's need. And they're still hanging in there. The down a little bit in kills, a little bit in gold, yes. But this game is absolutely within reach for both of these squads. As the laning phase at this point has almost entirely broken down, and we're starting to move into that mid-game, Taco. I think the main problem I'm having right now, though, Finch, is that Ollie's just had two really stupid deaths. And I just don't think that Bedtime's Calling should really be chancing such a heavy delay in game because this sure. Jean-Kui getting picked, both of those instances unnecessarily, uh, it was just him wanting to pretend to be Alpha against BGS gods, and now his team could pay the price for it. Scott Bro's gonna get pulled up into that Stingin Torment, and Bedtime's Calling still not having their entire team in the area to help play defense for this RDO. So Scott Bro's goes down. He's some good autos from Raiden. 
but are they going to be enough? No, Drizzle turns around with the Typhoon and goes right back in. The rest of his team's up front as Kana finds two. A double for the solo lane, Osiris. And now Raiden comes in and gets hacky as well. Suddenly three on the board for Bedtime's calling. TPC looks for the turnaround, but Ollie gets one as he finally joins the fray. With just Tier Toxic left, he'll have to leap his way out of there. Four go down, three still up for BTC. Ollie's just going to play zone duty upon himself. Oh, Sean dead. Kui, because he respawned from the base so late, <laughs> will just make sure to pick up the pieces that his team has already spread apart. And VGS Gods with the full team D aside, now swinging everything back over into bedtime's clear favor. It is a bit curious that Ollie has been willing to play so loose since he picked up the Warlock staff. You'd think he'd want to stay alive and try and get that stacked as soon as possible. But instead, he's been freely rotating around the map and occasionally way far away from the rest of his team. But it'd be hard to deny the impact of this Jean-Cui. Five, two, and seven so far having a pretty good game for himself and really a good set too. Ali has done a lot of things well for Bedtime's Calling to keep them out in front of EGS Gods. He's just got to be careful because yeah. as the match continues to progress, if VGS gods can consistently find picks onto this Jean Kui, they might continue to delay the game little by little until eventually it reaches a point where one team fight could essentially determine who's able to just run it down mid. Yeah, you're exactly right. So that's something that has to be cleaned up. As earlier, we saw the reinforced Greaves from Sarpe, and I was wondering, you know, is, is the rest of this build going to be tanky? It looks like not particularly Crusher, Hydra's, Brawlers are there. That's all damage. He does get the Mag Eyes, which gives him a little bit of extra CC immunity along with his beads. But Fire Giant now under Siege for Bedtime's Calling, and they've baited in Hacky quite nicely, and they're just going to try and lock him down. Hacky falls to the auto attacks from Raiden, and now they turn their attention to Tier Toxic, but TPC's been left on an island, and Sarpe is not the best guy to be stranded with. He takes him down. Tier Toxic still alive. The rest of Bedtime's Calling kind of gave up the notion of chasing down this tanky... Shing Ten, but instead turn their attention back over to the Fire Giant. Sarpe, though, yeah, I don't know kind of walking. low. Not sure that this is the Fire Giant pit you really want to walk into. Right, he makes it crack back across the field, but he's got to keep running. Drizzle has an eye out for him. Scott Rose gets knocked up, too, as Tier Toxic makes his way out of there. But in comes the Susano, the cleanup specialist. Marky Sparky gets a great stun on a con on the right-hand side. That gets him out of there, too. Bedtime's calling can't get the Fire Giant, but I think all they really wanted was exactly what they got, a scrappy jungle fight. Bedtime's calling were essentially the victors as well because of the fact that they were able to find numerous picks. Could still look to reinitiate onto this Fire Giant if they choose. Uh, with Tier Toxic being down for another 30 seconds or so, Bedtime's calling are going to have Scott Bros back into the action a lot sooner. And with that in mind, VGS God should definitely try to just prioritize warding up, getting some vision down right now near this fire giant pit. There haven't been very many wards in favor of VGS God surrounding these big map objectives. Pyromancer, though, is under siege now. Taco for Bedtime's calling. As Marky Sparky forced to dash away. VGS Gods have got to find a way to get on a slightly closer page. They've done a good job, I think, making it hard for Bedtime's Calling to get clean picks. That's set, set up for Drizzle or even Tier Toxic to come in and at least clean up a couple kills on the back end of these engagements. But if they want to be the ones who are actually winning the fights outright and not just evening them up afterwards, they've got to make sure they're engaging as a unit a little bit more. More like this as all five members are here and they're looking for Ollie, who's a little too far forward. Ollie will end up getting snagged up inside of that whirlwind ultimate from Tier Toxic. No escape from the Shing Ten on that one. But a nice Paolo pull in onto Hacky is going to prevent VGS Gods from collapsing on top of Kana. One for one, though, still favors VGS Gods. It's mid for support. And Scott Bro's in trouble. Marky Sparky getting hit by a rain of bolas coming out from right, and they're just not enough. But blink over the wall. Sarpe wants to make sure he can close the distance. Aegis buys a second, but not enough time. Two for two, though, as Marky Sparky goes down to join his friend Hacky, who was already sent back. Now can Sarpe find a way to survive up against Drizzle? Stuck in between the mini-wave and the tier two, there's just no way out. He goes down, too. And yet another spread out scrappy fight. Uh, Raiden doing his best to try and bring down the Shing Ten, but he just wasn't able to buy enough time. Now getting control just in time for TPC to collect the life of the Shibalanke. And Kana, sure, he's back into the territory, but 
He's not back into the action, not with VGS gods already having cleared out the vicinity. And Bedtime's calling for the first time, losing uh, the actual trade out uh, of the engagement. I think that that was the first somewhat clean fight that VGS gods had. And for the first time, TPC lived throughout the entirety of it. That's right, TPC's had a hard time of it staying alive so far. But it starts off with a thing you pointed out very early on, which is that Ali has to be hyper mindful of where he is in these fights. And it is tough, especially for a mid mage that has to play a lot closer than most mages. He doesn't have that same long range burst, has to be close to get maximum damage off. So if when the team is moving forward as a unit, if VGS gods kind of collapse past that, then all of a sudden, instead of being behind your back line, you're in the middle of VGS God, so it's a difficult line for him to walk. Scott Bros gonna narrowly avoid that Singin torment from Hacky, and I'm right there with you, Finch, but realistically, I, I think Ollie could have probably been positioned a little bit less aggressively and instead of kind of leading the charge for Bedtime's Calling. As a Jean Kui, I think he's just forgetting that he's prioritized damage, really, and not necessarily a hybrid type of build or, or a lot of defenses. Up under the Palau goes Sarpe and forces TPC to use the purification beads. A big ultimate for Marky Sparky, but it's Ollie who hits home first. And yet again, he has to do it by being so far forward, it costs him his life. It's a one for one trade. Scott Bros, though, doesn't like even numbers, makes it two for one as Marky Sparky goes down. They continue to hide under the tier two tower. Raiden can't quite force his way in, and BGS gods at least keep three members alive. But everybody's so poked out from VGS gods that they're all going to have to back to base. And that should give Bedtime Calling just enough time to try and bring down this enhanced fire giant. But Kana will get his assist with teleport off. And now this Osiris is going to look to try and play zone defense. Fire giant down to 30%, however. And VGS gods could make it back in time, actually. There, there's still time to get in here. Tier Toxic comes in. It's not even about contesting the objective. It's making sure they die for standing on it. Raiden tries to confirm it, has to use Aegis to get off, and the objective's been held now by VGS Gods, but in comes Khan over the top. Bedtime's calling, secure the objective. Lord of the Afterlife to secure they need, but Drizzle still wants blood. He finds Scott Bros on the back end, and a sloppy, sloppy engagement for Bedtime's calling. Kana is still looking for more, trying to find Tier Toxic. Cancels out the back. Doesn't even pay any more attention to Hacky, but I'm not sure that this Osiris is going to be able to run down the Shing Ten. Not when the leap is available and Tier Toxic will survive. But VGS Gods, I, I think, just got a, a little bit too hungry for that enhanced Fire Giant Steel. Instead of just letting the objective reset naturally, sure. they tried to pick it back up again. And they seem like they weren't on the same page about how to do it, too, which which makes some sense, a lot going on as Sarpei pulls back in TPC, and he'll fall to the damage on the dodge. though Marcus Spark in the back end has plenty of damage. Sarpei, though, finds himself a double kill as Hacky goes down as well. But Marky Sparky gets right, and now he's got some backup, a double kill for the Hunter. The Medusa finds two, but Kana happy to stay in the fray, even getting knocked up. He's only got eyes for the Medusa, finds the, the root that forces out the Aegis. But can he find the auto attacks? Marky Sparky patches back in, and that means Kana finds the kill. And it won't be the only kill that Kana's able to clean up. Drizzle will end up falling as well now. But Bedtime's calling. They picked up this enhanced fire giant a little bit ago, and there have been no objectives taken for it. VGS gods are still just essentially delaying the game. Now they have a chance to lock down Tear Toxic as well. Hacky's on his way to try and keep his solo laner alive as Tear Toxic jukes for his life. It's just not enough. But the Tier 2 tower this whole time was never under any pressure. So Hacky has still bought his team time, as you said. Now TPC is back. And the long range agony damage is quite scary. Bedtime's calling aren't going to find anything of substance off the back of this. Bedtime's calling, I think, have just been a little bit too oh, focused great. on finding kills uh, as opposed to just doing the, the map objectives and, and just resetting. I think that they're just more interested in, in trying to kill VGS guys than what they are of, of looking for strong lane pushes grouped up as a team. We've seen so many instances now of these stretched out engagements, Finch, largely because of the fact that Bedtime's calling when they have the opportunity to just back off and look for the reset so they can try and shove a, a T2 tower or something, they just chase instead. 
just look for picks instead of maybe some of these objectives. This looks nice though, the Gold Fury. Maybe at 30 minutes, actually the least helpful one, but you might want more damage against the Fire Giant or a nice Oni Wave to push for you, so they'll settle for the Gold Fury itself. Though they're pushed off if VGS Gods get there in time, TPC has the bombs, Kana stunned as well. And now with Tear Toxic teleporting in, it's going to be a problem for Bedtime's calling. Kana locked down, and no one else on the Order side can make it in. Drizzle cleans up the kill with the Typhoon, but they are absolutely not done yet. Drizzle and Tear Toxic still way far forward. Ollie ends up falling to the pressure from Marky Sparky. And all of a sudden, Raiden's been isolated. What happened here for Bedtime's calling? The dot damage has just been too problematic, and VGS guys were just able to collapse more efficiently than Bedtime's calling. Keeping that back line so suppressed ends up being the, the winning factor there for VGS gods. Ollie as well fell incredibly early on with Raiden. The carries were just stacked on top of each other, and it made it really easy for VGS gods to just prevent them from escaping. It really felt like Bedtime's Calling weren't convinced that that was really going to be a true team fight in that game or something like that. Because it really felt like they never were, were ready to counter collapse. Uh, initially, it's Kana who has a slow, painful death, and he ends up falling. We have to talk about it later, though, as VGS gods want more. They're going to move right into the Phoenix to try and grab the first one of the game. Tier Toxic goes right for Scott Bros and brings him back towards the team. But the rest of the squad, they've got eyes to the objective. Mid lane Phoenix goes down. And VGS gods, despite being down in kills, down in gold, they're ahead in terms of map progress. And they also have their opening. If Bedtime's calling, screw up another team fight, VGS gods are, are just going to look to end. All they need, honestly, is, you know, two to four decent picks. Three is the sweet spot, I think, for, for a lot of teams where three you feel comfortable enough to try and shove into the Titan room, and if that doesn't go successfully, then you can still typically look for a Phoenix after the fact. But there are two tier two towers remaining on the map still for BGS gods to square away. And with that in mind, got to remember that Titan will be a little bit tankier per each of those towers. You're exactly right. It's going to be harder now. Bedtime's calling to stay alive on the back end of a lost engagement. This door has been opened. As VGS gods and Bedtime's calling are both near and around the enhanced fire giant. Approaching 33 minutes here into this one. Kana wants to get things started for his squad. Aki's nearby, they're looking for some poke, but no one's hard committed yet. This is still just trades of damage before things get kicked off. Something else that we haven't really had a chance to talk about is Marky Sparky with that chin size, I think, is really just cutting into Kana so much more than ever before. And this Tier Toxic tries to find the Ching Ten ultimate to scoop up a couple of members, but instead it's going to be the Stingent Torment after the fact that catches Bedtime's calling off guard. Well, Kana looks like he was able to get the back off. He'll teleport back in to rejoin the fray right to that Tier 2 tower and re-aggress as a healthy Osiris. That's enough for VGS Gods to go with the Ghost and fall back. Tier Toxic will have a teleport of his own in 15 seconds. They're going to look for the Pyromancer first. But in comes Kana with the Flail, and that's enough to make VGS give up the Pyromancer. And now Bedtime's Calling have position around the objective. But Scott Bros and Raiden are backing. They'll have an extra Pyro... No, they won't! VGS Gods come in and steal it with an auto from Marky Sparky. So it will be VGS Gods who have extra movement speed with which to get back faster. Not just any auto, Finch. A Viper shot auto. Yes, that's right. Those glowing orbs dancing around that Medusa are the indicators that Marky Sparky has. Those Viper shots procced and ready to go. And Bedtime's calling. Probably just not expecting anybody to bother trying to contest. They knew that VGS gods had members trying to back at, at the same instant that they were pulling that Pyromancer. And a lot of teams don't tend to, to risk it for the biscuit, so to say, on a Pyromancer in these types of situations. Kana in some trouble here yet again as he's been locked down. Lord of the Afterlife gets him away from being caught up in the Whirlwind of Rage and Steel. Wingblade give him an extra bit of movement speed which retreats. Arpe goes up onto the Palau, surveys her kingdom and looks for a target. But it's Hakido who finds one. Scott Rose goes up into the air and comes right back down. And TPC finds the first one. Kana now in trouble the right hand side. Isolated and brought down by Drizzle. But no one was there to help TPC. Sarpe goes right to the back line and removes the Agni from the equation. It's two for one. 
keep Marky Sparky in the back of your mind. So, however, I love how Hacky is trying to play bodyguard for this Medusa. Sarpe now actually on the run. A thousand cuts going to be able to give him enough distance to avoid the paralyzing spit. And just like that, VGS gods still in the, the driver's seat here. They're the ones who took the, the one for two exchange. And they want this enhanced fire giant next, but I'm not sure that they're going to have enough damage right away to clear this one. Fire giant now under siege and at about half HP. Bedtime's calling though are here to try and defend. It looks like VJS gods are just going to give the objective up and take the fight instead. Ollie goes down first. Stop me if you've heard that one before. But the objective has been leashed. And now Sarpe wants back into the action. Goes right towards Hacky, but Drizzle comes in and punishes Raiden, who was isolated from the back of Sarpe. And now the Dodgy could be in a little bit of trouble. Magi's cloak gets procced. And Tier Toxic's done enough, though the FG still stands. But Ali and Raiden have quite some time before they'll be available to, to rejoin the fray. And with that in mind, VGS guys should very much still be looking for, for a push onto this Enhanced Fire Giant, especially since there's a Fire Minion Wave pushing up into the mid lane that Bedtime's Calling have to take care of. And Scott Bros not exactly going to deal the most damage as an RDL who's full <laughs> tank. That's right, not going to have the easiest time clearing. It's now the Fire Giant under siege with four members here. This should belong to VGS Gods as they start to burn the objective. I believe they have a Primal Fury to their name as well to assist with this as the Fire Giant buff goes down for all five members. And now we can move into the siege phase proper. There's still one more tier two tower to clean up, but remember that mid Phoenix is weakened and weakened for the rest of the game. VGS Gods can go grab that and try and break the base open one more time. But with that tier two tower going down, I think VGS Gods might have finally reclaimed the actual gold lead, even though they've been the ones actually with the, the pressure, the ones who can actually make the decisions on the way the fights happen for a while. Well, you also have to remember that VGS Gods don't necessarily need waves anymore to try and siege these Phoenixes, especially with that mid Phoenix already being weakened and VGS Gods, because of the enhanced FG, getting uh, the 50% the of backdoor protections not being there. That's right, it's much, much easier to strip down objectives, or structures rather, without the wave, once you've got the enhanced fire giant. And now Bedtime's calling up to try and defend. It can be so difficult to siege into an Agni, but BTC don't have one on their own side to defend with. They're gonna need a big play from Sarpe. I imagine to try and keep this defense working. I feel like it's got to come more so from Ollie than Sarpe. It'd be yeah. awesome if Sarpe can get off a, a, a nice Powell out to kind of open things up, but Tier Toxic's done waiting around. He's ready to go in here, and VGS gods are falling awfully low right away. Scott Bros falls, but so does Tier Toxic. Sarpe finds a double kill underneath, but Drizzle gets one of his own. It's two for two so far, and in goes Ollie. You said you needed a big performance from him. Well, how about removing Marky Sparky from the equation? That seems pretty big to me. Now Drizzle in some trouble. A double kill for the Jean-Cui, and Sarpe, unstoppable, finds a couple of his own. Looks like we're going to have a pause coming in, but a big-time defense and a DSI from BTC. I just don't think that VGS gods paid enough attention to their back line like they probably should have. Yeah, Ollie waited you. it out as well. Love the patience that the Jean Cui had to wait until everybody had actually started to drift apart from the other. Isolating Marky Sparky there in the back line and finding that pick is the primary reason why I think VGS gods are not going to be able to continue that siege. And then it's really easy when the primary damage dealer is already dead for everyone else to kind of just come through and take care of the front line. VGS gods also hard commit on the Scott Bros. I don't know if he is the target that you want to be trying to commit onto, but Tear Toxic blink ults to take down Scott Bros specifically in that last engagement. I mean, the, yeah, they got the audio, they got that kill. The only other one they get though is Khan, and the rest of the team gets wiped. I wonder if maybe just a couple uh, too many cooldowns or maybe too much aggro and focus was put onto that Ardeo in particular around that right side Phoenix Siege. And that's part of why they couldn't get it. But I mean, he's not alone. Sarpe had a great fight too. And like you said, all these patience is rewarded as he finds a double kill on the backside. That is huge for Bedtime's calling to hold on. And that will essentially bring that enhanced fire giant for nothing. VGS guns went through this huge ordeal just to get that objective in the first place and then to be shut down so quickly 
on their first real attempt at a at a team fight uh, against bedtime's calling defenses can be a little bit demoralizing as well fire giant won't be up for a while now it might look like no one has the buff but as you eloquently pointed out that's because vgs god's got a white so the buff goes to waste and the fire giant doesn't spawn any sooner just because you don't get value out of the buff. They did at least get the tier two tower in solo lane, remember? So that they can go right to the Phoenixes in every lane from now on and threaten there. But even without the actual buff itself being up, Bedtime's Calling are surging beyond the Fire Giant pit. And look and see if they can catch anyone out, maybe force out any relics, put any Magi's cloaks on cooldown while they wait for the big time objective to show up. But Taco, is that how you want to see VGS gods take those fights if we saw on the right-hand side? I mean, how should they be looking to initiate? It was way too spread out. I feel like the front line went entirely too deep for the, the back line carries to realistically have any sort of follow-up potential. There were some good instances, like Hacky got a, a decent Singe and Torment off, and I believe a pick occurred because of it, but it's just not enough to find one kill off of a Singe and Torment. You need to be pulling more relics, more burnouts and really just getting the pressure off onto the Jean-Cui. Ollie's going to be the big base defense underneath these Phoenixes for Bedtime's Calling. And I don't know if we gave enough credit to the Shibalanke in the defense. And I purely mean that in terms of the ultimate. It must be so much harder to make that siege in even when you're the ones at the Agni and it's not as scary of a mage defending as normal. When you just can't see, it's so much harder to communicate and make sure everyone's on the right targets and following up at the right times and what's been used. So that certainly had some impact, I'd imagine, as well. As Kana might be in trouble. There's the Darkest of Nights coming out and Hacky getting chunked by the Shibalanke autos from range, but Kana not done yet. But a huge ultimate for Marky Sparky hits two. Kana goes down, Sarpe has to use the Palau just to get up out of danger, but no one's there to help Scott Bros. Drizzle gets the kill. A surrender vote coming out. You can't surrender here, it's game three as Hacky takes him down as well. It's a five min up for BGS Gods, only two for BTC. But all of the waves are pushed in Bedtime's Calling Favor, and VGS Gods can still be a little bit risky trying to make this play happen. Ollie does still have that Jean Cui ultimate if need be, and Hacky might actually end up falling before his team even gets the initial push off. Tier Toxic not going to make it over in time to the Cerberus. Hacky activates the trap card, and because of that, he'll be set to the graveyard, unfortunately for him. The rest of VGS gods, though, they want the mid lane Phoenix, and they certainly can grab it, though they don't have a minion wave. They're going to do this the old fashioned way and tank it up on the side of Tier Toxic. So the mid Phoenix will go down for sure, but I don't know if they can push it to a late game Shibalanke and a late game. Jean Queen, no, they'll just get the mid Phoenix yet again and fall back for now. Speed buff stolen, and VGS are out of there. If Hacky hadn't isolated himself for bedtime's calling, I think that there was even some potential for VGS gods to look for a game end in yeah. that instance, because had they all been grouped up together, it would have been significantly more difficult for Bedtime's Calling to put up any sort of defense underneath that mid Phoenix. And five versus two, you're usually going to have enough peel and, and crowd control to deal with over aggression or any sort of initiation. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be Ollie if he hadn't dove four people by himself. TPC finds the first kill. Marky Sparky gets a double for himself. And this is a little bit too much for Ollie in the late game, man. You got to make sure that you're back with the squad. That is set up for three for zero for VGS. And with Enhanced Fire Giant up, Taco, they might not even want it. It looks like they just want to push down mid in the 5v2. This could still be dangerous, though. Drizzle is going to end up falling to Sarpe, but Sarpe might have actually given up his own life for it. If he can bring down TPC in the process, that could be a huge saving grace for Bedtime's Calling. That is good to have at least gotten Drizzle and to have put TPC on notice that he could fall at any time. But Sarpe has to back Scott Rose might end up falling here by himself. Mad Guy's cloak keeps him from getting lifted by the Stygian Torment, and a big three-man stun is there. TPC tries to contribute from range, because he can die at any moment, but this is all time. This is just time, time, time being bought by Scott Bros and giving his team a chance to nearly respawn. He'll eventually go down, but Sarpe keeps them busy as well. I don't know if they can still end as less side beings in trouble as well. I think it's best for VGS guys to just take away another Phoenix and slowly whittle into the defenses of Bedtime's Calling. Scott Bros wasted so much time uh, for, for VGS gods that 
they recognize it, it's a lot easier to just go for the guaranteed objective. And plus, having two different lanes of fire minions pushing in is typically only going to bode well for the team that has the fire minions. Bedtime's calling now uh, a little bit more unlikely that they try to even prevent BGS Gods from getting the next enhanced fire giant. And I don't know. I, I just, I'm not sure that that was worth it for Ollie. No, I, I don't know. I don't think it was. And unfortunately, VGS gods are able to, or at least unfortunately for Bedtime's Calling, were able to make a pretty big push off. And now they've got two very valuable Phoenixes on the back end. The left and mid Phoenixes should pull Bedtime's Calling away from feeling comfortable from defending this enhanced Fire Giant. It looks like that's the case. Though Kana's nearby, Sarpei's in the jungle as well. Maybe they do want to try and contest this, but they can't find their way in. Fire Giant goes down, and VGS God again get ready to go make the siege. And this is huge. VGS gods have really struggled this phase. And if they can find a big win here up against Bedtime's Calling, it could be something to build on. You have to remember what happened the last time, though, that VGS gods had this enhanced fire giant. And Sarpei already trying to just bring down Drizzle by his lonesome. But Drizzle looking to take the fight, not scared. And now Sarpei, I don't think he's got anywhere left to run. He's definitely in some trouble once he lands. Blink gets away from the auto over the wall towards Pyro. And just like that, Sarpei the Magician makes his way out of there. Pulls off another escape act. Though he's being hunted down by Drizzle, but he just won't make it to him in time. Didn't know where he was. That's huge from Sarpei to make it back to base. I just, I'm amazed that VGS gods weren't prepared for the Blink. How could they have caught up to him? I mean, Marky Sparky would have had to hit an excellent auto. Spread. <laughs> you spread a lot better there, and you spread for the distance of, of a blink covering in all directions. They just right, had... Right, you don't huddle at the base of the, the Powell out, right? You're, you're further out, yeah. A little little bit of an oversight there from VGS Gods, but they won't have to worry about the Powell out ultimate, and the same can be said for Bedtime's Calling. They won't have to worry about that Typhoon ripping through the, the center of a team fight here. So Drizzle and Sarpei both kind of just waiting it out, I think, for their next opportunity to strike. Right side Phoenix will certainly be the call. Their fire minions pushed up in mid. They'll be pushed up soon in left as well. They just took down a minion wave there. So this team fight becomes critical for Bedtime's calling. That they not only keep the Phoenix up, but that they do it quickly enough to defend their Titan as well. As minions start to pour in, VGS gods have bought enough time for the ultimates or tear talks and Drizzle to come back up. But it's Bedtime's calling who wants to initiate the sprint popped and they rush right in. Staging and Torment comes through from Hacky as well, and they've already been able to get Ollie down quite low. Kana, though, finds a kill of his own to make it one for one. Ends up to Drizzle now, trying to pick up the pieces, but Hacky and Drizzle are the only survivors. Hacky actually getting ripped apart by Raiden's autos, and Drizzle just left him alone. Raiden finds Hacky as well, but remember, there's minions pouring into the Titan room on the backhand side. Now it becomes Drizzle's job just to try and keep them from backing but Raiden, Raiden has found the space. Heal back now and try and get back here in time to clean. So it's clear, so will start pay. And I think they'll keep the Titan alive for now. Catastrophe averted by BTC in this game. Manages to hold on for just a few more moments. But catastrophe averted for how much longer, Finch? This Titan is so incredibly low right now that VGS gods should just be looking to strong arm Bedtime's calling out of their Titan by running straight into the base. That's, that's all they've got to do, honestly. They, they have so much AOE damage as is between the Agni Bombs, the Medusa Petrify, and a Typhoon. Realistically speaking, VGS God should be able to close this one out, but there is opportunity for Bedtime's Calling if they're able to catch VGS Gods off guard before they enter the Titan room. But what a call from Bedtime's Calling on that right side, Phoenix to at least try and fight on their own terms. They, they initiate beyond the right side Phoenix with that huge sprint coming out from Scott Rose and just try and barrel stuff BGS gods. And it really ends up working. They come out of that fight the betters, able to get back in time to keep their, their Titan standing. But remember, it's not gonna sustain up until all three Phoenixes respawn. That Titan remains vulnerable. And to be fair, I completely understand where Bedtime's Calling were coming from, uh, trying to initiate on the right side Phoenix. That's the only Phoenix they have that's still 100% perfectly healthy. And it's where they first made their successful uh, Phoenix-based defense against VGS Gods. But the real question now is, can VGS Gods close out Finch? And 
on paper, I'm thinking they should be able to. But Bedtime's Calling could definitely come up huge here if Ollie is on point with his next ultimate. This is some critical counter warding that's happening. I seriously mean that. That's one of those paths that VGS gods could use to try and move in and just rush the Titan of Bedtime's Calling. So the more information VTC can have, the better. This is why they're kind of playing so far forward. If they let VGS gods any further in, they can blink past, jump past, whatever it takes, and just go right into the Titan. In fact, they want to try and keep this Phoenix standing. So yet again, they're going to push beyond the actual Phoenix and fight them out here in the jungle on neutral ground. Marky Sparky in trouble right away. Aegis buys him time. Beans gets away from the Palau, and so he still stands. But we cannot say the same for Tear Toxic. Sarpe puts him into the grave. OTPC, though, finds Ali, and the rest of BGS gods looking for the Surge. Drizzle in some trouble, but there's just too many members of Bedtime's calling around. That's a double kill that comes through for Sarpe, but TPC, he just goes right to the Titan, but Raiden's there. They kill him and keep the Titan standing yet again. VGS gods just it's cannot so break the final line of defenses here. And for what it's worth, had TPC been able to dodge at least one or two more abilities, that Titan was going to end up falling to the Agni damage alone. Instead, though, it ends up sustaining. And now with the mid, mid Phoenix respawning, Taco, the Titan has a chance to start recuperating a little bit in that back room. Somehow, Bedtime's calling from the brink of disaster have held on time after time by taking these fights outside of the range of those Phoenixes, and VGS gods have not had the answers. The pressure's on right now for Marky Sparky as well, as he's going to have to deal with this first shove from Scott Bros and Raiden and a pretty big archer army as well for VGS gods. This might be a turnaround performance for Bedtime's Calling. Everything Bedtime's Calling has done up until now has led right here to this moment where they have a chance to try and grab the game. That's a big ultra for Marky Sparky to buy some time, but isn't enough. He gets Spot Bros first, but he goes down. In comes Tier Toxic to try and grab them with the Whirlwind of Rage and Steel. He ends up getting the kill on the Kana, but it's not enough. Bedtime's Calling only needed one shot, and they took down VGS Gods. And I think that the, the main issue here for VGS Gods wow. and why they weren't able to close out there is because they let Bedtime's Calling take the fight to them on Several Bedtime's times. Calling terms. You yeah. have to take initiative there if you want to close out these type of matches. They just could not find a way to break their base all the way open. I love where TPC's mind was at, his head, his, his head space to try and dive onto the Titan. It was so low that they could have killed it. But it looks like he was the only one that was willing to commit everything to making it in, and he didn't have enough damage on his own. And, well, that's pretty much all she wrote. At TPC trying to be the, the savior of this <laughs> match for VGS guys, but unfortunately, it's going to be another drop set for the team. Yeah, if you let games go 52 minutes, you can lose one fight off the back of a wipe. That's all that it took. Bedtime's calling. Grab the win. Let's get it back to the desk, though. I got to know how they saw that game. I saw a long one that VGS gods really should have been able to close out a couple different times, Tolly, but ended up falling just short. That's true. It, 28 minutes, by that time calling was up about 7,000 gold. They had such a dominant lead objectively, and there were so many kills between the both of these teams. Yeah. Even at that point, it was 54 kills collectively, and the game ended at 51 minutes, almost 100 kills between the two of them. It was an absolute barn burner. There's no doubt about that one. Plenty of action throughout the first 52 minutes, but it ends up ending with Bedtime's Calling taking the set and reclaiming that third spot, or holding onto it, I should say, over VGS Gods. The I think that Scott Bro is a great highlight to start out with. Not necessarily this play, but the one where it looks like VGS Gods can go and end, and instead they chase Scott Bros for 30 seconds or so. I mean, they, he, he's able to eat up an eternity of their time. I feel like if they just ignore him and go to the Titan, we may have been on this post-game desk 15, 20 minutes earlier. And that's something VGS gods can look and reflect upon watching the replay or watching the cast. But a better instance for Bedtime Calling was that defense out of Ollie on that right side. Phoenix Siege, his Blink Jean Kui completely disrupted what VGS wanted to do on that initial engage. But that didn't really stop VGS from looking for the end because of that siege on the right side. That Titan almost goes down to 20% health or less, allowing TPC to get a little bit closer to lethal. But not not quite there. 22 kills for Sarpe on this dodgy, an incredible performance from him. 17 on the other side from Drizzle, another great performance from a jungler who actually ends up holding onto his boots through all 52 minutes, never found the time 
to sell those for an elixir of speed. Tier Toxic had a really great start to the early and mid game, late game. Tanks ended up getting shredded pretty easily, and that's kind of what happened to him. But Tier Toxic in the in the mid game was doing pretty well for himself. How about 57,000 player damage though? for Drizzle on the Susano. And that Susano was still doing a lot of work despite running into the brick wall that was Scott Bros on the RDO, having a couple of early kills on the Susano. Still didn't stop that mid to late game threat that a Susano provides. Really impressive stuff from VGS Gods for a lot of this game, but end up falling just short again. Neither of these teams are going to be able to make it to the midseason Invitational, so it's not the end of the world, I don't think, for them. I mean, it hurts, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really end up impact too much as we look at the standings and see the VGS gods will maintain that caboose position here at 2-8. and eight. Yeah, our cold gaming cannot really be caught up to, unfortunately, for any one of these teams securing their spot in the MSI. Going to be curious to see how they kind of stack up to the North Americans, though. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch and see exactly how they're going to end up doing it. But this is only our first set of the console league today. We've got plenty of action coming at you, so make sure you get a quick break in. We'll be right back with more SCL.